Welcome to a cult of personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire at occultofpersonality.net. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. A Cult of Personality podcast is available on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher Radio, Acast, and all the best podcast apps. This is episode 172, featuring an interview with Michael Bertio, created in collaboration with our friends at Black Lotus Cult. A Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to the Occult of Personality membership section, and our patrons who participate via the Occult of Personality Patreon campaign. I'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, the costs for me to bring it to you are significant. Your financial contributions make sure this free podcast continues. Please support a Cult of Personality podcast by joining the membership section or donating via the donate button on the occultofpersonality.net website or via Patreon at patreon.com slash occultofpersonality. Our Patreon page now features an exclusive RSS feed for patrons meaning that if you subscribe via Patreon to support the show, you will get some content just for you. And if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks, and I salute you. A Cult of Personality podcast is also sponsored by Miskatonic Books, an online store that focuses on the esoteric, occult, ceremonial magic, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, Witchcraft, The Golden Dawn, as well as dark fantasy, classic horror, and supernatural fiction. They carry books by all your favorite esoteric publishers as well. Just visit MiskatonicBooks.com. Temple of Thelema is a true outer order of the greater mysteries, providing ceremonial initiation, structured training, and regular group work, all in conformity with the principles of the Book of the Law. An investment of time, effort, and commitment is expected from each member. Each is expected to aspire fervently to the great work, to dare, with courage undaunted, to perfect that work and ever to apply his or her best effort to effect harmony within the order and within the world in general. Founded in service to the AA, College of Thelema seeks to guide the student to an understanding of the law of Thelema. Most especially, this means a deeper understanding of oneself and of one's true will. A combination of instruction techniques is employed, including seminars, written texts, and individual work. For over 40 years, College of Thelema has published journals in the Continuum and Black Pearl, as well as several books on occult subjects maintaining high standards in Thelemic education. Visit Temple of Thelema at www.thelema.org. Now, in episode number 172, an interview with the one and only Michael Bertio. For more information about him and his current book, Ontological Graffiti, go to fulgur.co.uk slash artists dash and dash writers slash Michael dash Bertio. Michael Bertio, author of the famed Voodoo Gnostic workbook and Hierophant, 
of the Voodoo Gnostic Current is a rare visionary in modern occult studies. Raised in a liberal theosophical household, he was drawn to the esoteric and spiritual approach to religion and being from early on. After studying philosophy in New Orleans and having been ordained as a deacon in the Anglican Church, Bertio was sent to Haiti in 1963 where he taught philosophy and was in charge of the local Anglican Museum. It was on the Magic Island that Bertio met his spiritus rector, Dr. Jean Main, who initiated him into the secrets of the Voodoo Gnosis. His close collaboration with Jean Main, first in Haiti and then later in Chicago, lasted until the Voodoo master's death in the early 1980s. Bertio stands unique in the spiritual world. His system of occultism and gnosis is unlike any other. Instead of reworking the occult past and clinging to classical theories, he works mainly on Gnostic radionic lines and esoteric creativity. Deeply rooted and based in the magical world and traditions of esoteric Voodoo, Bertio has managed to introduce a great number of other spiritual currents into his system to unite areas so seemingly apart as German idealism and theosophy, to Shinto and Bonpo, Bertio has spun a metaphysical web connecting and bringing them into occult harmony through the threads of esoteric Voodoo. To aid in this metamorphosis, Bertio also stresses the creative aspects of magic and gnosis. In addition to being a writer and philosopher, he has produced many evocative works of art, including paintings that have been used as magical instruments and gateways to the spirit world. He has not only greatly influenced contemporary occult circles and individuals, such as Kenneth Grant of the Typhonian OTO, the Chaos Magic Scene, and Gnostic Circles, but also musicians and artists. I'm proud to bring you this interview that was created in collaboration with our friends at Black Lotus Cult, who did all the heavy lifting. You can find Black Lotus Cult online at blacklotuscult.com. They've also created a unique new video series featuring Michael Bertio, and you can find links to those videos in the show notes as well. Good evening on behalf of the Occult of Personality show. We have the pleasure today of speaking with Michael Bertio. Michael was well known in Gnostic Fudan and Theosophical circles in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, in the 70s, Kenneth Grant uh, began publishing his Typhonian trilogies, uh, which perhaps uh, opened Michael's up uh, work up to a, uh, a whole new audience. Uh, and also showed people some of his artwork, uh, which was very important to his spiritual practices. In the 80s, his Voodoo Gnostic workbook came out, and his recent publishing has been taken over by Folger Esoterica. And we are on the eve of his latest work, Ontological Graffiti, being released. So we were going to talk to him today about his writings and art uh, good evening, Michael. How is the view from your art studio high above Chicago? Well, I guess everything is going along fine. It's a cloudy day, but uh, we've had a, a fall-like summer, so everybody has adjusted to it. But there are beautiful little white flicks of color on the beautiful lake uh, from the sails of the ships People are going out, getting ready for the weekend of uh, uh, sailing their boats and uh, connecting with the water elementals. <laughs> I always tell people you have the best view of Chicago, particularly when the sun is coming up over the lake. Well, of course, it, it, it's very impressive. Uh, certainly it's uh, something that I really didn't know I would ever have until I moved here. Excellent. All my life I've uh, lived with a view of water, though. 
when I was in Canada, when I was in at home in Seattle, uh, I always looked out the water, uh, out the window, and saw beautiful water elementals. Um, of course, uh, being a child of the moon in Cancer, I uh, I really have a, an affinity to the element of water, which uh, sometimes comes out in my choice of colors and artwork. Very good, very good. Well, the first book that we were going to uh, speak about is, of course, the Voodoo Gnostic workbook. Uh, kind of a curious beginning to that book, uh, something that you had told me. Um, it was put together uh, essentially uh, after a, uh, a failed attempt at a lecture that you had gone all the way to New York for. Could you uh, tell the listeners a little bit about uh, how that workbook came together? Well, in the 70s, Mark Lowley and I gave a number of seminars at the Midland Hotel here in downtown Chicago, maybe about four to five a year, sometimes time of the season, sometimes just just whenever we felt the energy uh, needed it. And after uh, seven, 1978, uh, we uh, ceased uh, those. And uh, Mark went on to his own uh, career, and I started rewriting some papers and also bringing out a whole new series of, of uh, what we might call uh, advanced lessons in the uh, Monastery of the Seven Rays uh, continuum. Uh, through the 80s, this continued. And towards the, about 1985, uh, I was told, or asked, shall we say, if I would be interested in giving a seminar in New York uh, by some of the Haitians that are mentioned in the Voodoo Gnostic workbook, especially Luke Gazzard, who was a friend of uh, Dr. Louis Martello. Uh, Leo Louis Martello was one of the major... Uh, voices of Wicca there in the Big big Apple, as they say, and uh, I, I said, well, I think I might be, and gradually, uh, Herman Slater, who was running the uh, Warlock shop and uh, had his bookstore and also a, a school attached there in uh, New York, in Lower Manhattan, I might add, in the village, although it originally was in Brooklyn, I believe, and moved to uh, Lower Manhattan. Anyway, uh, he contacted me and found, asked me if I'd be interested, and I said, well, possibly. Uh, but anyway, I said, I will talk about some of the courses I've been uh, writing. And so he, he said that would be very agreeable. Well, up to the time of maybe about a couple of weeks from before the time when I was supposed to go to New York, uh, he called and it, it seemed that um, maybe not too many people in the community, the neo-pagan and Wiccan community, were really too interested in uh, my presentation or approach or coming out at that time for uh, a seminar. Uh, and especially uh, some of the topics seemed to be a little more uh, cerebral than what they were used to with their own, uh, what we might call hands-on uh, uh, Wiccan practice. So uh, he said, well, well, we'll wait and see. Until about a week before, um, I had a dream where uh, one of my occult teachers uh, advised me not to go to New York uh, and uh, that I should be prepared for the event of the uh, seminar I was to give not, not happening because of lack of registration. And uh, it was my understanding uh, that there were various groups uh, sort of pushing for it and, and others pushing away from it. And, uh, and so uh, Herman called me uh, maybe about four days before I was uh, supposed to fly out. 
uh, and uh, he, he discussed the situation, and I said, well, that's fine, but why don't we just cancel it and uh, have it some other time? And he said, I said, okay, I'll get back to you. Then he called me a day later, and he said, I've given it so much thought, I would like to publish a book. Now, the seminar was to be called The Voodoo Gnosis, and he said, why don't we publish your book as a Voodoo Gnosis workbook or the Voodoo Gnostic workbook? And I said, well, that's agreeable, so I'll just send you copies of all the material, and you can edit and uh, arrange it. I'll give you a sequence in which it was written, and you can go ahead and uh, bring it together. And it would start out with the uh, Lucky Hoodoo course, uh, which I wrote about 1977 for private students of the Monastery of the Seven Rays who were interested more in voodoo than they had been exposed to and kind of had a, uh, shall we say, a sympathy towards the American form of voodoo or uh, the Southern voodoo. Okay, so that worked out. And so the uh, voodoo Gnostic workbook emerged and it became a kind of uh, underground encyclopedia and uh, I might add a kind of a spiritualist voodoo book. Certain schools used it, certain others just avoided it apparently. And uh, some, book, uh, some Wiccans and the voodooists uh, mentioned it in their bibliographies because they always look in there. And, um, uh, for example, Margot Adler uh, included it in later editions of her uh, Drawing Down the Moon, and uh, Sally Glassman had her in her wonderful book on uh, uh, voodoo and witch witchcraft with her uh, really marvelous art in it. So I decided that uh, this was the way it was to be diffused, and... I had, as I said, there were all these papers, and they all went up there, and they were published. And uh, what was interesting is that I th I don't know how many printings they had, but anyway, the first one was sold out quite fast. And then later, maybe two or three years later, a a pirated edition came out in the Southwest, put out by a a company that specialized in radionics, and some friends of mine uh, saw it at a radionics convention in uh, the suburbs and bought the two volumes and gave them to me, and I immediately contacted uh, Courtney Willis, who was in charge of the business administration of the uh, Gnostic movement that I was to which I was connected, and uh, he immediately uh, uh, got the lawyers after them for uh, stealing uh, one of my properties and, of course, uh, denying my copyright. Well, of course, uh, that was settled. But then uh, later, uh, Weiser brought out a second edition, which was in some ways a little more, uh, shall we say, professionally produced because, of course, Weiser had uh, more facilities to bring to bear on the publication. And it had a long introduction by uh, Courtney talking about the organization. Well, the, the organization was basically uh, grounded in the Hyde Park uh, study group that we had, which was an actual spiritualist uh, voodoo uh, society, but meeting uh, informally, more like an inquirer's uh, organization at first. And uh, from that, the material came for the publication of uh, the book uh, Ontological Graffiti. But uh, the Voodoo Gnostic Workbook is still available, and it's used as a uh, reference book and a textbook by various groups because I still get communications. And another thing that was kind of interesting, in some of the chapters uh, at the end, I say send, send the report to Michael Berdio at uh, 
Post Office Box 1554, Chicago, Illinois, 60690. And the people that bootlegged my book with two bonus, taking my name off the cover or on the front page, uh, forgot about that or else probably weren't even aware of it. And so people were still writing to me who had purchased the bootleg edition, <laughs> which I found rather humorous. Uh, it just shows that even, uh, shall we say, crime uh, needs better editing. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, uh, the Voodoo Gnostic Workbook is still being sold, and uh, new editions I, I'm asked to sign from individuals who come often to the uh, occult bookstore here in Chicago where I meet with a group for our film society. Uh, so it, it's still carrying its weight as it, as it should since it's quite a large book. But I might say that everything in it is basically what we've been doing for the past 30 to 40 years and especially the chapter on the voodoo energies, uh, the psychological or the depth psychological impact of the uh, papers in the uh, what we call research readings, that's still a very, very important part of my work. And I consider it in a, in a, in a condition where I would never want to edit it. I would only want to add or amplify it with case studies if I ever had to rewrite it, you know. But uh, uh, it's a it's a wonderful uh, book, and uh, I myself uh, constantly refer to it because uh, at the period in which we are talking about, it more or less defined concepts in a, that had never been defined before. And uh, I found it to be personally very helpful to have it in existence. But it certainly had a wide, wide diffusion. And it's actually something that many members of the Wiccan and uh, neo-pagan and Gnostic uh, continua, shall we say, benefit from simply by its existence. So I think... Uh, it, it came uh, into existence really as a result of a, uh, a failure registration on the part of uh, proposed students, but I think it's, it's lasted longer than uh, maybe the memory of some of those old tapes. <laughs> well, the, uh, the discussion groups that we created on Facebook, uh, every single week there's an artist somewhere in the world who posts a piece of art that is inspired from reading the Houdan Gnostic Workbook, so it is, uh, it seeds uh, grow many trees to this day. Well, I'll tell you, one of the things that I learned from my association with uh, individuals who are quite connected to art and to uh, Wiccan and uh, Earth religions, especially Lady Olivia, to whom uh, the ontological graffiti is being dedicated, uh, the association between occult energies and art is extremely strong and should be explored whenever it, it surfaces. And there are so many different opportunities to create things after reading, let's say, parts of a paragraph even in the Voodoo Gnostic workbook. I consider it very, very much a stimulus for even my own personal art. Now I find benefits from... Uh, tremendous number of benefits from uh, connections with parts of the Voodoo Gnostic workbook. Well, you'd mentioned some of your um, older papers and some of the work that you published in the 60s and 70s. So one of those uh, uh, works was uh, Cosmic Meditation, which brings us into modern times, your relationship with uh, Folger who had uh, a pretty stunning edition of that. Uh, a lot of people picked it up. In fact, it sold out uh, through the publisher. And there's a, a very large difference. It showed people a different style, uh, much more lucid than certain passages in the Gunan Gnostic workbook. 
uh, and very uh, cohesive. Uh, what uh, what are your thoughts on that work now? Well, I think uh, first of all that uh, uh, the addition that Folger brought out was uh, perhaps the best thing for that for the period of uh, of its uh, shall we say breakthrough. Originally, it was a sequel to Lucky Hoodoo, and it was called um, The Perfect Medium. It was published and uh, by Mark Lully uh, at the Absolute Science Institute School, just like the uh, uh, Lucky Hoodoo was initially published in 1977, I would say, by the Associates of a Haitian uh, Uncle Sciences, which was a, another branch of uh, the Absolute Science Institute. <laughs> Excuse me. But the uh, Lucky uh, Hoodoo and the uh, Cosmic Meditation, uh, when it came out originally as the perfect medium, it actually presented a, a softer, more... Buddhistic or Eastern focused um, presentation of spiritualism. Definitely a spiritualistic book because the uh, opening chapters initially uh, discuss the possibility of connecting to one's spirit guides and uh, the whole concept of mediumship. However, if you look at the final chapter of the cosmic meditation, it's a Tibetan Bonpa ritual. It's actually that we go uh, astrally into the Tibetan temple of the Bonpa religion to a meditation uh, exercise between the leader of the uh, community of lamas and the, the members, and it gives a more exotic and I think a totally different perspective, but it's still spiritualism or shamanism in an Eastern context, and that's what I wanted to achieve is at the beginning to, be, to have the spiritualistic uh, psychology and exercises that you might find in, uh, say, the books of Alain Kardec, but end with something more Eastern and more universal so that the transition from one to the other could be smooth and unbroken, showing, of course, the basic idea that meditation is one spiritual practice and it is one, shall we say, world that we all participate in when we meditate. Now, when Folger brought out the uh, cosmic meditation, one of the things that uh, uh, we did was to add artwork of a, a kind of energy to give direction and focus. And uh, that has continued in all the books that Fulger has brought out for me. Actually, uh, the coming together of art and text um, is very important, but I never really had an opportunity in the um, Absolute Science Institute publications to connect as closely as we could later because of technology. Well, the uh, voodoo cartography certainly uh, gives the text and the art uh, very well. Uh, a lot of folks knew that you were an artist, and they saw some of your art in the uh, Typhonian trilogies by Kenneth Grant. However, those early editions, um, the art was printed in black and white. Um, so when Voodoo Cartography came out, uh, your first full-color book, uh, it, it blew a lot of people away. I remember distinctly um, we had a, a soft launch uh, at the uh, Seattle Esoteric Book Conference that year. And uh, I believe I was talking with, uh, with our friend Vaj Moore at the time, and when he saw it on the table, 
It's the only time I've seen that man speechless. Uh, he just kind of put his hand on the cover and stared at it uh, with all of the the bright and vibrant colors. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, voodoo cartography? Well, yes. Uh, voodoo cartography uh, was based on the uh, month, month of August uh, 19... Uh, let's see, 1963, when I was in Haiti and working for the uh, Anglican Church. I was uh, allowed a lot of free time, and uh, I went to various centers of voodoo religion and art, and many, many, uh, what we might call just road houses that were decorated in Haitian art, but had shrine rooms. But with uh, my uh, Haitian teachers, especially Dr. Jamin, now, it, it, it was, in a sense, a diary that I kept, and what I tried to do is remember what the paintings look like because later when voodoo cartography was being written, I wanted to re reproduce in miniature form certain paintings that were very large. Now, in the Kenneth Grant books, the Typhonian uh, trilogy works where my paintings were shown those paintings actually were from the 60s and 70s, and they appear in the ontological graffiti in color. But the, the first artistic experience I had of Voodoo was in Haiti when I saw these paintings that I reproduced in my own way in the, in the voodoo cartography it was actually a map cartography uh it was a map of sacred spots or places that i visited and expounded what uh, i was taught as uh, voodoo uh, uh theology now the uh paintings that occur in the uh Typhonian Trilogy, those were done for the meetings of our High Park study group in the 60s and 70s. So they're later than my experiences in, uh, in Haiti in, in 63. Uh, practically everything I do is rooted in some type of my uh, experience. I mean, the uh, attempt to uh, represent what I had seen in colors, uh, circumstances allowed me actually the greatest freedom to do the uh, voodoo cartography for the simple reason that it was at a time when I was um, free, but I had just uh, uh, gone through a, a tremendous uh, uh, medical uh, shall we say, uh, voyage. And uh, what I wanted to do was uh, focus on the healing power of art and voodoo art in particular. So in many ways, painting became my therapy. And uh, I, my schedule was such that I had uh, space and uh the choice of art materials to create and recreate these Haitian uh, memories. And I felt it was a very wonderful experience. I still consider uh, voodoo cartography as an as a exquisite work of art. I really see it as being so beautiful and every part of it as a symbolic connective between my consciousness, my, my healing process, and the spirits of the Haitian deities. But um, it, it came also, in a, in a way, as a surprise for me because I didn't know that that sort of art would be, shall we say, marketable in the, in the sense of a, of a popular publishing I, I really felt at first that it might not be, but the spirits uh, assured me, which I believe to have been an inner uh, intuition, that all I had 
to do is follow the imagination of art, and I'll be guided to producing a work that would be very successful. And, and, and I just trusted in the spirituality and the spiritism of the, the whole uh, process. And I was very, very happy. And I was so happy that it came out. But it, in a way, it did make people speechless. They never anticipated that voodoo would be so, shall we say, rich in color dimensionality. And I, as far as I'm concerned, uh, that's what, that was the way I saw it, you see. And I was there in Haiti for that month of August, and it was a tremendous, tremendous event in my life. In fact, it transformed my thinking on about a hundred different dimensions. Well, the um, paintings you mentioned in Kenneth Grant's works, uh, our friends at Starfire Publishing uh, took over the um, not only the final volumes of the trilogy, but have now been. Uh, reprinting the old ones in enhanced editions, and they've managed to get those old paintings uh, re-photographed and present them in full color, which uh, has made more people speechless. And as you said, uh, these will be featured heavily in ontological graffiti, which the pre-order was uh, just announced uh, in the last month here, uh, one of the fastest-selling pre-orders in Folger's history. So certainly a lot of excitement there. Um, but as you mentioned, it, it is autobiographical and it picks up uh, after the events in voodoo cartography and takes you into Chicago. So I know listeners will be very excited for any information uh, on ontological graffiti that they can get. Uh, can you give us a little uh, preview or taste of, of what they are going to encounter once this book ships? Well, first of all, uh, let me say that um, I came to the Midwest and was working at the Theosophical Society for 18 months. Uh, Dr. Smith uh, invited me to join the research department there, and uh, at Wheaton, uh, the Theosophical Society headquarters, everybody lived like a family. It was actually like a, a progressive monastery, and uh, it was quite wonderful, but because I had been lecturing at theosophical sites in the Pacific Northwest, I, um, I was asked by certain branches to give lectures here in the city of Chicago. Uh, so what happened is that I once uh, gave a series of lectures on Annie Besson's connection with social work and social reform. And uh, someone uh, asked me if I would be considered, considering uh, doing uh, work in the war on poverty, which was then being talked about because of uh, President Johnson. And I said I would because I did believe that theosophy could be applied as could any spiritual movement that was valid. So eventually I... Uh, took all the exams and so forth, and uh, I uh, was installed as a uh, caseworker in a uh, part of the war on poverty on the south side, on the southeast side of Chicago. Now, what is interesting is that uh, I had regular students coming to my lectures at the Theosophical Society, and they helped me arrange my transition so that I moved into a, an apartment. Uh, uh, I left uh, Wheaton one day, and later at that, that day, I moved into an apartment uh, in the southeast part of Chicago. And I must uh, thank them for that because uh, the transition was really very, very smooth. Not that I was uh, had a lot of luggage or anything like that. But anyway, what was interesting is that one of the first assignments I got in my job as a caseworker was working with the Haitian refugees. So. Over, over the years, my job involved me with Haitian people 
And my leisure time involved me with Asian spirituality, which I found very, very interesting. Now, gradually, I decided uh, to move into an apartment in uh, Hyde Park, which uh, would enable me to be close to work, close to my field, and also in a university environment. And uh, from my standpoint, quite heavenly, because uh, there were several bookstores, used bookstores around me. And uh, of course, I, I was always a lover of books. In fact, maybe I would consider it one of my few addictions. But I, once I or, got organized, uh, my Haitian connections, my, some of my Haitian teachers had moved not to Chicago, but to the northern suburb of Evanston. So about the same time they were in, in the Chicago area, I, I had relocated. And gradually, some of the Haitians that I knew moved closer to me by taking place, uh, getting apartments and sharing quarters in uh, uh, the southern uh, part of, of Hyde Park and the northern uh, end of Hyde Park. And we decided then uh, to set up uh, some kind of a discussion group. At first, you start with a discussion group, and gradually the discussion becomes more and more um, what we might call uh, structured. And uh, gradually, the, uh, because of the Haitian presence, it leads to a kind of uh, paramasonic or Rosicrucian or uh, voodoo Gnostic uh, introduction to uh, ritual work through initiation and training in a special tradition. And this gradually developed in from 1966. You said I moved to Chicago in April of 1966 by the by August of 1966, I was uh, organizing discussion groups in the uh, areas where I was, and I was being helped by Mark and by Hector and a number of other individuals who gradually helped bring together a, a very small group, actually, nothing over 30 or anything like that. We just didn't have that many chairs. But it became a, a center for a, uh, a voodoo initiatic society. And it was from this group that uh, the idea, uh, shall we say, con what connected to the wish that somebody wanted me to write a course on uh, what we might call uh, initiatic training in the occult. And this was uh, the group from the Monastery of the Seven Rays who connected to me through also my public lectures downtown at the Theosophical Society. So it's constantly being exposed to new opportunities to teach and to write uh, simply by just uh, this type of public service. Well, gradually, of course, the organization of the uh, Voodoo Society, uh, actually, it, it had a secret occult society, and it's still maintained, I might add. Uh, uh, Courtney Willis is still the director of the uh, Special Voodoo Society, which is different from the uh, OTOA organization, but uh, in in a sense complementary. But anyway, uh, that organization started hold, holding more formalized meetings, and I kept the uh, the notes and structures. And if I didn't, I obtained copies of the uh, structure and the. Uh, procedures of, of, the, of those meetings on various occasions during the month, usually 
tied up somewhat with the faces of the moon. And that became the basis for the chapters of uh, ontological graffiti. But uh, that was from uh, that period that's covered in ontological graffiti would go from 1968, when it was had developed a, a formalized structure, to uh, the early 70s. Then my work after that, as the final chapter of ontological graffiti uh, will explain, uh, my work became involved more with our, our uh, Mark and I were giving seminars downtown at the hotel, and then I was writing uh, the papers that later went into the Voodoo Gnostic workbook as lesson plans and structures for uh, instruction in various uh, aspects of voodoo energy and Gnostic energy. So there was always this continuation, this continuum I was immersed in. It must be, of course, a that turn in because it was so structured. Um, for each year, you might say, what were you doing then? And is it in a book? Yes, I can say so. Truthfully, it is. For example, uh, Voodoo Cartography was P1960, uh, uh, 63. Uh, in 1964, there were some papers that I wrote that were later recycled into the uh, Voodoo uh, uh, Gnostic workbook. And then uh, in, 19, uh, in 1966, I was uh, putting together some materials that later became uh, lesson plans for the uh, instructions that the Hyde Park group had in uh, 1968. So. I really, uh, <laughs> at one time I, uh, I, uh, I had a, I, I would have a manila envelope for each, or a folder for each one of these uh, lessons, you see, and it, it became actually a chore to uh, just be my own archivist, you know. Now, of course, fortunately, I have uh, archivists helping as volunteers, but, uh, Every, every moment, it seems, or every month or year, there was some focus that I could trace in one of these books that came out, you see. Very good. Well, that um, brings us to the end of part one of our interview here. So a cult of personality members can go to the membership section to listen to part two. Uh, in the meantime, those who are interested, we do have our uh, Black Lotus Cult uh, video lecture series uh, where Michael speaks about a lot of his art that will be in ontological graffiti, uh, and we uh, display some of that as well. Uh, for those who are interested in the pre-order, it is available on Folger's website. That would be folger.co.uk. And this has been an Occult of Personality uh, production. Uh, Occult of Personality is a podcast which peers beyond the veil of esoteric matters. Established in 2006, uh, they've amassed an ever-growing collection of insightful interviews with practitioners, scholars, and teachers from all around the world. Uh, so we encourage you, if you have found this uh audio smorgasbord anywhere beyond their website, uh, do go to occultofpersonality.net for more information. Uh, so thank you uh, for part one, Michael. And again, members, stay tuned for part two. In the Occult of Personality membership section, you'll find the second half of the interview with Michael Bertio featuring some very interesting insights from a living legend. Don't miss that excellent, exclusive recording. Just go to occultofpersonality.net slash membership and sign up if you haven't already. It's the best way to support the podcast while receiving access to a tremendous amount of additional, exclusive content. Thanks for listening, and until next time...